I'm Lauren, nice to meet you. Um, and yeah, I'm the materials alchemist at The Unseen. Um, and I kind of stand here today having a really mixed background. So although I'm educated in chemistry, I'm also educated in design. And I don't want to stand here either. I'm really kind of a true blend of both. Um, so I will open the presentation. The Unseen exists to explore the unseen, a house fusing matter into material. We investigate the unseen world around us by stepping beyond sensory experience and taking knowledge out of research and into material. We fuse scientific study with creativity to enhance matter at the hidden level. We offer this discovery to you through our art and through performance. The world is full of unseen magic. We invite you to see the unseen. So that always freaks everyone out, so I like to play it first. <laughs> but the Unseen, although we're the art house and I'm all here to present the art house today, we're a, we're a huge sort of collective of different skills. Um, and the team started um, not that long ago, it was six months ago, but the girls in the picture here, Krista and Jess, have been friends of mine for the past 10 years. Um, and basically all we do is anything that you can't see in between me and you right now, we like to sense through biological and chemical technologies. Um, so that could be heat, it could be UV, it could be emotions, it could be pollution, it could be, I don't know, space weather, which we'll get to. Um, but, but purely we're just a sort of, you know, bunch of weirdos that I've met in my 10 years of working in both science and design um, that come together and, depending on the skills that set that is in the room and the project that we're working on, really have this connection and this alchemy um, of to what we're creating really and it really you know if one person left the collective the collective changes and 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 I'm going to talk you through some of the stuff we've been doing because it's much easier to see than to, for me to talk about because it's a bit weird um so it all started a long time ago uh, 10 years ago I started as a fashion student um actually it's 11 years ago I just turned 29 last week um and and really just I don't know you know any 19 year any sort of 19 18 year old girl's dream is to end up on the Parisian catwalks I guess um but Two months into university, I had the um, lovely, lovely uh, experience of breaking my back <laughs> and having to go straight into hospital for two years. Um, so I think anybody at that age who um, has to go through a series of tests telling them they've got all sorts of weird problems wrong with them um, isn't going to want to come back to a fashion degree and just design fashion in the way that it, it's been given. Um, any of you who've been in hospital understand that the, the pervasive methods of monitoring health and monitoring um, pain is very, very like normal, it's it, not normal, it's, it's very kind of, um, you know, like ubiquitous, you know, if, if, I'm, if someone says to me, Lauren, how's your pain today? And I'm like, I'm, well, it's about, you know, is it one to 10, I'm three. And then they say to Jess, you know, well, what's your pain today? And she says three, how do we know that those pain levels are identical? My pain threshold could be hell of a lot stronger than Jess's or vice versa. And I got really, really, really annoyed at the, the, the system um, of being asked every day, one to 10, Lauren, how are you today, one to 10? Um, that I thought that I could, you know, try and, and use my creative skills and push them into something that really would help that situation within a healthcare sort of opportunity. Um, so we come to the pollution absorbent jacket. So having two years at, in the hospital, I came back to university um, and went straight to the chemistry department, knocked down the door and forced them to give me a chemistry degree um, and, and <laughs> to work with them for three years. Um, and bear in mind, I had no A-levels of chemistry or anything. I literally was just like, I have this idea. I have this idea that we can use colour as a language and that we can really try to change people's lives through the stuff that's around us. Um, and after a lot of hard work, uh, the pollution absorbent jacket was born. And it originally came from uh, the idea of trying to stop 16-year-olds from smoking. So if you had a cigarette that you could dope with something that and the cheeky fag break during lunch would bleach your mouth in some way for temporary measures. Your tutor would A, know you were smoking and B, you'd look really uncool. So how could, how could you do that? And I kind of worked that out. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, this is great that it's in a cigarette, but why can't it be in clothing? And why can't it be something that monitors carbon emission and not necessarily just uh, smoke? So the pollution absorbent jacket. It changes colour from yellow to black to let you know how much carbon emission you've absorbed around you each day. So if you can see on the video here, depending on the level of carbon emission in the atmosphere around the human, you get this deepening in black. And then when you go into fresh air, it becomes yellow again. So this is where it began. You don't need to clap. <laughs> it's not a... But the, um, it kind of start, yeah, it started out, and it was really, really much of a case of me sitting there literally every day monitoring what was going on in these lab specimens, and I always intended it to go into the fashion industry. But the wearable technology industry and the fashion 
perspective has had a lot of bad press. You know, it's very gimmicky from back in the 90s. There was lots of stuff with flashy LEDs and all this kind of different stuff that, um, you know, really basically just threw electronics onto clothing and everyone said, great, well, you know, we're walking around in the future, which I didn't believe was right. But when graduating from Manchester, um, the fashion world still didn't think that this was right. And so I ended up working in every sort of industry other than fashion. I was going around the world sort of, you know, lecturing in concrete, putting this into airplanes, doing lots of sort of great material science, but never really sort of getting it into people's hands, like your guys' hands, never being able to give you something that you could tangibly touch or take home with you. So I stopped um, consulting and went back to the Royal College of Art to study textiles to try and marry up this kind of compounds that I was creating with the aesthetic and the sort of vision of, of how are people going to understand this, you know? Um, because 10 years ago was a really different place when it comes to material science and wearable technology. And this was born, which I guess isn't that... E I mean, I <laughs> maybe you would wear the other one before this one, but, but really it's a, it's a poetic piece that combines um, science but also combines aesthetic. So I used the feather um, because it's notoriously hard to dye, and it set me a technical, technical sort of challenge of over two years, what can I sense in the environment and what can I get it into? Um, at the time, I was writing my thesis on Egyptian mythology, and if you weigh um, the heart against the feather, if the heart's heavier, you go to hell, and if the, the heart's lighter, you go to heaven, which, you know, is not good if you live in the Egyptian times. But, um, <laughs> but, but if, if I could impregnate these feathers, I, I, um, technically, I could begin to sell, tell a story. And I obviously didn't want to just stick at one colour, so yellow to black is great, but we don't all wear yellow to black. So I started to think about all the different stuff in the environment between us now um, and how I could assign colours to each of these things and create compounds that would sense this. So in essence, you can live colour mix on the palette in front of you, on the garment in front of you. So this feathered garment uh, changed colour from yellow to black to green um, to white to tell the story of the Egyptian mythology, but also to show technically what I had done within a feather. And we have some, so you can play with them later. Um, and I graduated the Royal College, and it was all great. Um, and then I went straight back into research. <laughs> so trying, the purpose of going to the Royal College was to try and um, prove to the fashion industry that there is something more magical in fabric than just the stuff that you're buying at, at different conferences and different sales places worldwide. Um, and again, it didn't feel like people were ready. I still wasn't getting the in that I needed um, to try and touch people's lives. And I started um, consulting for again, a wealth of different industries for uh, building out materials libraries and designing sort of the plane of 2050, the, the spacesuit of 2050, all these different great, great things, but again, nothing tangible. So here is one of the feathers, um, which I can show you, which changes colour. So you can see just with UV, um, wind across it, and oxygen. These feathers go from purple to white, and then they'll literally just fluctuate throughout the, the day. And as I was saying, as I was head, head, head under in the Royal Academy of Engineering doing all of the material libraries, at the same time, um, Tim Walker, who's an amazing fashion photographer, and Katie Grant, who's an amazing British fashion um, stylist, picked up one of my pieces and put it onto Kate Moss. Um, and I didn't know this was going to happen until it landed in my post box. <laughs> um, and that really gave me a bit of clout to say, well, come on, you guys are shooting my pieces. Why won't you listen to what I've got to say in terms of the stuff around us? Um, so I killed my consultancy and threw a huge funeral um, and wrote to everyone, <laughs> everyone that I tried to, to reach out to in the past sort of uh, four or five years and invited both, you know, all the design houses of London alongside all of the scientists that I'd been working with. Um, and I basically, yeah, stood up in front of them, got them all drunk and said, I'm not going to work for you again, <laughs> um, but, you know, there's definitely somebody in this, work, this room that can, can help uh, you articulate what the future of materials is going to look like. So um, I dressed in black for two years um, and hid. So we, we did the Victorian morning tradition. And I, I just, I don't know, I think philosophically, I just really wanted to, to sort of work out what I was doing because I, it was such, such different lives. And anybody who works in design and touches across science or vice versa will understand that the language between an engineer and a designer or a chemist and a designer, you know, you can't force these people together. You have to build relationships and you have to build a dialect that people can understand and that, that you can, you know, sort of discuss what you want at the end of it and be respectful of both divisions. Um, so part of my two years of um, 
being broke and dressing in black uh, was about trying to, to understand that. And um, eventually I just thought, I'm just going to put all of my eggs in one basket and just do it for myself and reach out to the people that I'd known over these 10 years and see if they wanted to join. So we launched the Enzyme in February, so not even that long ago. And we did a huge ritual <laughs> underneath Somerset House, which is where they hold fa London Fashion Week. Um, so we're called the Unseen, obviously, because we like to sense the Unseen, but we like to do things a little bit differently that stop and make people listen. Um, and although this is super, super poetic and very kind of, you know, creative, uh, at the same time, we were really engineering a very, very um, innovative technology, and we showcased it on this model, which we set on fire, um, and, and showed all the flames propagate around the body, um, which changed the color of the piece. But it was easier to show this technology in a narrative sense. So it just went against the traditional catwalk. Um, I think when you're trying to in implement something new and, and show a new way of fashion or a, a slower version of fashion, you kind of have to go all out, otherwise it gets lost in the fashion industry. So Air was born, um, and the reason I, I'm hell-bent on trying to change the fashion industry because fashion dictates everything to do with colour and trim and materials. If, fashion, if the fashion industry projects a material to be in fashion, the prices and the, the, orders, the orders go up and the prices go down. Um, and my experience in hospital really taught me um, that I wanted to create something that would change people's lives, but at the same time, the NHS couldn't fund that. So if you can, if you can sort of, I believe, if you can kind of trick the industry into adopting your materials, it will bring the price point down for you to be able to create something, again, that touches everyone's lives. And this is a classic situation in that it came from a consultancy for Formula One, and we had to track um, uh, the aerodynamic of the car to let you know which area of the car was, more, was, was good and which area was bad and less aerodynamic or more aerodynamic. And they wanted to do it in a, in a physical way before they did it in a digital way, just to show the, the colour change and build a digital platform. So this garment um, is impregnated with the same compound, but I had to tailor it then back to the human aerodynamic to see what the human aerodynamic looked like. And it's a garment, which is beautiful wing-structured piece, um, which changes colour depending on different fluctuations around the body of air. So um, the bluer it becomes, the more friction you're creating. And it shows these unseen sort of turbulent wings behind the body, which happens when you walk around your environment anyway. But the tailors in the team, the cutters in the team, worked with the shape and the leather to hand cut it or hand stitch it all, so it really, really gives you turbulence. It's really quite erratic. So I'll show you the video of that so you can see the differences. So as the wind comes across the body, you just see a, a red-green-blue temperature shift um, or pressure shift as well, which uh, shows you these different fluctuations. And this is really uncontrolled. So literally, as the wind hits you on this shape, it's much more shell-like. You just get, when the wind hits, boom, you just get the color come through. So it's just making you aware that there's other realities around you other than the one you see. And we always call it code in the jacket. So to me, this is just data. It's just a visualization of data and just using um, a platform of material and color change other than the streams of code you always see. Um, and although that one was uncontrolled, we also uh, created a controlled version. So this jacket changes throughout the year. So it's uh, green in the spring, uh, red in the, the summer to um, autumn, and then becomes blue during the winter and then refreshes itself uh, sort of January. And then we released this in February, um, and we'll or it. I'm gonna quickly there. Um, this was the, the fire sculpture which you saw in the, in the last one. Um, but we were challenged by um, the Barbican Gallery in London to 
although we, because we were sensing the ultimate environment in front of you, sort of the UK and the world environment that we always see. And um, the Barbican said, well, what, what is an, the unseen would you want to see other than just our own environment? And I said, sort of jokingly, let's do space weather. <laughs> and, um, and then, well, we did. And it kind of, although I keep telling everyone it was really, really easy, our coder keeps saying, please stop telling everyone that. But, um, but it just, it, you know, why I never thought of what space weather would look like or even if there was weather in space. Um, but we used digital data and created a bespoke environment chamber and, and created a website with live stream. So every 15 minutes, these, these are um, fluctuations in space, so the solar flares, the magnetic winds, the aurora borealis, which is all controlled by the, the solar flares or a solar eclipse. The data, um, which we found online and from working with a few other bodies, pumps through into the chamber every 15 minutes and which alternates the environment which then projects itself as a color change upon the piece um, and this is a website where it's like little animations so for us it was a really fun project because it just sort of um, put the feelers out as to what we could sense other than just the the sort of space uh, that we live in um, which brings us to the project which we just released not that long ago, which was a collaboration with Swarovski. And uh, Swarovski originally approached us and we were a little bit like, this is not us, we would not want to work with a brand like that. But the more we got into the research side of things with the gemstones, the more we understood that they're actually a really smart material-based company and they've been working in technology and wearable technology for a very, very long time, but are not pigeonholed like a brand like that. And uh, they, they you know, sort of said to us, as the unseen, what, what kind of stone would you wear? And um, for me, I wouldn't want to just wear a beautiful diamond or a beautiful ruby. I'd want the stone to, A, do something different, but also look great. You know, it would be a sort of combination of, of, of putting things into these stones that mean they can sense stuff that I can't see. Um, and Swarovski have the ability to lab grow their stones and to understand nature to the point that they're, you know, manipulating it and creating something of their own. Um, so why do that just for beauty when you could do it and add properties in that really mean you could do something for, for purpose? Of which the, the gemstone headpiece was born, um, which is 4,000 spinel stones, um, which we, we picked because of their magnesium aluminium properties. And uh, funnily enough, these are all uh, magnesium aluminium and is put into a lot of printed circuit boards that you use in the electronic side of wearable technology. Um, but for us, we wanted to, to create, again, something that would visualize something you couldn't already see. And we treated 4,000 of these stones with a very, very sensitive compound that I reformulated to change color purely to temperature, but in four uh, colors in 0.5 of a degree bandwidth. So it went from black to red to green to blue um, in this 0.5 bandwidth. But the spinel stone is an ace conductor. It conducts heat like nothing else. So depending on what area of the brain that is in use, you get different color fluctuations across the head. Um, and this was a complete happy accident. <laughs> so we were like, great, spinel stone, superconductive, really, really, really sensitive heat formula. Let's see what happens. Um, and we were as shocked as you know, the trials indicated. And uh, that was a real sort of nice discovery that we got to. And, and um, yeah, everyone who's worn it has never portrayed the same color patination. Um, and we're going forward, it's a very new project, a very concept-driven project, but going forward, we'll, we will be working with sort of MRI technologists to really look at the cortex of the brain, um, which, depending on whether your eyes are open or whether your eyes are shut, give you different fluctuations. And just giving something that literally is just, you know, two technologies and two, com two visions coming together to give something that wouldn't have probably existed before. Um, which is, brings me to the end of my talk, which um, is kind of, you know, I've, I've, for the last 10 years, I've really tried to be pushed that wearable technology doesn't have to be electronic, it doesn't have to be hard, it doesn't have to be unhuman. And, um, and I don't know, I think I've learned from the philosophy of an idea is only an idea until someone makes it happen. Um, so, I don't know, kind of go big or go home is my <laughs> lesson <laughs> to be learned. Thank you.